Welcome to the Better Questions Podcast. In this, our season two finale, I cannot believe that we are already done with season two. It has been an awesome, wild ride. Uh, But today's episode, we're asking the question, should Christians be patriotic? And we have an awesome guest for our episode today. We have Pastor Brian Zond. He is the author of Sinners in the Hands of a Loving God, and his most recent book, uh, which is a similar topic to our question today, is Postcards from Babylon. And Andrew's got it right there. Vanna White right here. Yep. So we were super, super excited to have Pastor Zond on our podcast. We actually kind of can't believe it. We're kind of still in shock that we just talked to him. And uh, for the six of you who watch us on YouTube, you probably... (laughs) probably noticed that I am not sitting next to Dan this time. I'm actually sitting next to Chris, which just tells you that I would rather drive 13 hours and record this podcast here and not sit in that little baby chair that I have to sit in next to Dan when I record at home. So I was much more comfortable this episode. Uh, It was a great episode. I feel like I learned a lot. I know all of us learned a lot. So let's get into it. Here is our conversation with Brian Zond, Should Christians Be Patriotic? Well, we are extremely excited to have Pastor Brian Zond with us on the podcast. For those of you who may not know who Pastor Zond is, he is the lead pastor of World of Life Church in St. Joseph, Missouri, and he is an author who's written books like Sinners in the Hands of a Loving God, which I have read, and most recently, Postcards from Babylon, which I have handy right here, which I have started to read, but both are really good. So, Pastor Brian Zahn, welcome to the Better Questions podcast. Thank you. It's good to be with you. Great. And today on the podcast, we wanted to address the question, should Christians be patriotic? And it's uh, pretty obvious to say that the last couple of years, politics and patriotism has been uh, very much talked about in Christian circles, and we feel like there's a lot of good and bad dialogue around that. And we just wanted to address patriotism and nationalism and try and find better ways to form these questions and conversation. Is that your question? Can a Christian be patriotic? Yeah, that's kind of like the uh, guiding question we want to address and reform and and see if we can yeah. find a better question than that through the course of our yeah. discussion. Well, I mean, of, of, like so many of these uh, difficult questions, you have to define terms. Right. If by patriotism we mean a pride of place that contributes to uh, civic engagement, responsible citizenship, I think it's almost always benign and possibly even a good thing. Um, So if we're using patriotism essentially as a something of a synonym for good, responsible citizenship, that's fine. If we mean much more than that, then we begin to sail into dangerous waters. If we mean, uh, I am going to prioritize the well-being of my nation over others or at the expense of others, or that I'm going to pledge my allegiance to my nation above all other allegiances, then that's a problem. Uh, Christians should always have a tenuous relationship with patriotism and national identity. It's a part of who we are. Um, You know, we all have some sort of national identity. We are citizens, hopefully that, you know, if we're not refugees, we're citizens of some country. And we want Christians to be able to participate in contributing to the well-being, the human flourishing of their nations. But Christians always have to have a tenuous, a, a, a kind of hesitancy towards going full into patriotism or especially nationalism, um, that's when it becomes very problematic. Um, I don't know. Here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking 
this will this will jump right into it and maybe stir up some things. Sounds good. Let's do it. I think probably all of the listeners, viewers have probably, if they're paying attention as they drive around, they've probably seen this. You drive past a church, probably would be somewhere in the vicinity of an evangelical church. And let's say they like, for whatever reason, they like flags. So you have an American flag. And then you'll have the Christian flag. Christian flag, of course, I'm not really keen on what we call the so-called Christian flag, because it's not a part of historic uh, Christian iconography. It's obviously a recent creation that attempts to conflate Christian symbols with the American flag. So right off the bat, I see that as problematic. But let's leave that aside. Let's take it in good faith. Let's take it for what it purports to be, and that is an emblem representing Christian faith. But let's say that this particular church, and you'll see many of them like this, uh, maybe they're on a budget they can only afford one flag pole. <laughs> They've got two flags, mm-hmm. but one flag pole. Well, the nature of two flags and one flag pole means, you know, one is going to have to be in the superior position and one in the subordinate position. Well, you know how it's always done. It's always done, the American flag on top, and then penultimate, secondarily, in the subordinate position, is a flag that's purported to represent Christian faith. And I just want to... I just, I just want to slam on my brakes and go in and talk to the pastor and say, what's going on here, pal? Uh, what are you saying? I think, I think what it is, I think nearly all of the congregations that have this phenomenon on their front lawn are unaware of what they're doing. But I describe it as a moment of unintended truth-telling. What that is saying is... Uh, We love our Christian faith. It's important to us. It matters deeply. It's so important that it's it's the second most important thing in our life. But it is subordinate to our identity as Americans. Now, uh, I think most congregations would be very uncomfortable with that description. Most of them, I think, would, because there's some sort of almost intuitive sense that I think Jesus is supposed to be number one in our lives. I think there's something about that. Yep. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first commandment. Um, and so if you said, are, are, you, are you testifying publicly on your front lawn that your commitment to Christian faith is subordinate to your Christian, to your commitment to whatever you want to call it, patriotism, national identity, America first, whatever, uh, I think most of the time they'll push back. And they say, oh, no, it doesn't mean that. I say, well, what does it mean? I mean, if it doesn't mean anything, if it's just, you know, if it doesn't really mean anything, of course, flags are all about meaning. They're, they're purely simple. Yeah. And if it doesn't mean that, then switch them. Reverse it. Put the Christian flag on top and the, the uh, American flag subordinate, which is w- what should be the reality of a Christian's life. Generally, I have tried this with a few people, and they'll say something like this. Often they'll say, uh, well, you can't do that. It's illegal. To which I say, number one, no, it's not. Number two, so what if it were? Are you saying, indeed, that my Christian faith is subordinate to my allegiance to, to the nation? That's when it becomes a problem. And I think, I think, I mean, I didn't write postcards from Babylon for no purpose. I wrote to address what I would describe as the crisis of fidelity facing much of the American church in this current moment. Um, I I think we are seeing a crisis in the rise of white Christian nationalism that has to be called out. It has to be challenged. So if by patriotism you mean pride of place that contributes to responsible citizenship, yeah, all for it. If you mean much more than that, it begins to get dangerous. And now, you know, I have to do this in every podcast, every sermon. I don't plan it. It just happens. I have to give you a Dylan line. Uh, And this this is a good one. In fact, it it comes off of the Infidels album from 1983, which I just coincidentally just listened to before this podcast because, I don't know, I just did. But it has it has. It has the line in the song, uh, Sweetheart Like You has this line. 
Patriotism is the last refuge to which a scoundrel clings. Steal a little and they throw you in jail. Steal a lot and they make you king. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, I feel like you need to be playing some guitar. That's Dylan, 1983. Man. I love America more than I love Jesus. But yeah, but why do you think that level of patriotism that gets to the point of being dangerous s does often come across as so appealing to Christians? Or why do you think so many Christians find themselves in that camp? Well, a couple of answers. One, part of me wants to say, well, it's not particularly unique to Christians. I'll get back to that, though. Um, you know, we have to form a self-identity. We have to belong. Human beings are the most, by far without question, the most intense social animal. We, we only survive through belonging to a group. Uh, it's very easy then for a group to gain its cohesion by having a common enemy. And what we do is we take our fear, our anxiety, our insecurities that we all carry around with us, and we pool them up and we project it on a vilified them and other. It produces great social cohesion. It's very cathartic. It feels good. It is demonic. <laughs> uh, that's the problem with it. That, that unity around a common enemy. Uh, I mean, it, that's, that's the easiest way to unite a people. And it's the way it's most often done. The problem is the Holy Spirit um, condemns that. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of advocacy. One of the ways to understand who the Holy Spirit is is to understand who the Holy Spirit is not. The Holy Spirit is not the spirit of accusation. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of advocacy. So this is a very human phenomenon to gather around a vilified other. And so we are Americans and we hate whoever it is, you know, we happen to hate. Depends on what, you know, decade we're talking about or what century. But we, we will have our, our enemies. Okay, we are not them. Christians, though, you are right in saying it seems to be that there's a particular problem. I would say in general, this is, I'm generalizing, but I think there's general truth to it, that the most over-the-top, America-first, um, extreme nationalist in America often would self-identify as a Christian. And what's happened is, is you have had the phenomenon of the conflation of America and Christianity into a single entity where they have, they've become one thing. All right, so we're not just having this conversation, though, in terms of um, generic, general, uh, vague uh, nationality. We're having this in the American context. So let me say something about America. America is four things. America is not one thing. America is so big, so influential, the world's only true, current, true superpower, economic, military superpower, that it is four things. Now, before I, before I give these four things, this is not entirely unique to America. This has happened throughout history with all empires. Maybe I should, maybe I should give the – I should define empire. Because I don't want people to just to hear that as an empty pejorative. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it, as we read the Bible, the Bible acknowledges from the very beginning the reality of nations. And God seems to be uh, generally, positively inclined toward the phenomenon of nations. Now, understand that nations are not going to be as we understand. They're not, they're not the modern nation state, which really emerges in the 16th century. But they are common ethnicities that rally around common governance and leadership. But be that as it may, uh, God seems to delight in the diversity of nations, their culture, their language, their ethnicity. It seems to be celebrated. Uh, what God is opposed to is empire. Empire, I will define as rich, powerful nations who believe they have a divine right to rule other nations and a manifest destiny to shape history according to their agenda. The reason God has a problem with empires is because what they claim for themselves, this divine right to rule other nations, manifest destiny to shape history, is the very thing that God has promised to his son. So empires always become idolatrous 
and present themselves as a rival to God. This is not a minor topic in Bible. It is a consistent theme that runs from Genesis to Revelation. It's prominent in Genesis, Exodus, Isaiah, Daniel, uh, all four Gospels, the book of Acts, a little bit in Romans, and especially the book of Revelation, that God loves nations, he's opposed to empire. Okay, so I've defined my term. So what is America? America is four things. America is a nation, a culture, an empire, a religion. It's all of those things. America as a nation and as a culture, there's both. Okay, we know there's the 50, there's the 50 states and we know where the borders are. Okay, mm-hmm. that, that's easy to identify and define. And then there is American culture, too, that, it, that transcends our borders, of course. I mean, I travel yeah. the world widely and everywhere I go, I, I see America, uh, you know, and I actually get pretty tired of it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't mind having McDonald's here. I just don't want to see it in Port- <laughs> Portugal. But I do, and I, and I just yep. I want to stand and say, good people of Portugal, you are better than this. You have fabulous food. You do not need this. But um, so as, an, as a nation, a political entity, and as a culture, America is a mixed bag. It's good and bad. But I, I, I have no problem. I have no hesitancy saying there is much to be admired and celebrated. There is much about America as a nation and America as a culture that is admirable. Uh, the entrepreneurial spirit uh, leading the way for almost a century in scientific advancement and technological development, a commitment to certain forms of democracy, etc. I could go on and on. Uh, the contribution America has made to the arts and all of that sort of thing. These are things to be uh, appreciated and celebrated. But America as an empire, you can use the term superpower, but I'm going to use empire. As an empire, then it becomes problematic because you now have, as I've described, a nation that is asking for idolatrous allegiance that somehow imagines itself as an agent for accomplishing divine purposes in the the world. And if, if it comes from a Christian background, it's likely to develop a messianic complex. And so you have, for example, you have beginning with President Lincoln and then virtually every president since trotting out the tired trope, America is the last best hope of Earth. I mean, every president says that. Uh, Democrat, Republican, it doesn't matter. But for a Christian, you just have to say, (laughs) that's nonsense. No, it's not. You're trying to talk about Jesus, but you're saying America. It is not America that's the last best hope of Earth. It's Jesus. And that's what we mean when we say Jesus is Lord. Finally, America as a religion, of course, obviously that then becomes idolatrous. But that's where I'll get the most pushback. I think our viewers, listeners will say, America is not a religion. Ah, but it is. Mm -hmm. And and that we don't see it is because it has been so, um, there's been such a synthesis, uh, such a static conflation of Christianity with its various vocabulary, texts, iconography, with Americanism, we'll just call it that, that people don't recognize it's, that it has in fact created another religion. I I say all the time that one of the greatest challenges for pastors in America is that we are trying to make disciples of people who are already thoroughly discipled into a rival religion. Uh, and, And of course, when I say religion, think about it. America is a religion complete with canonical texts, with holy days, with sacred spaces, with um, sacred images, with, for, for example, how about this, uh, with martyrs and, and, and its own version of saints. If you visit the Capitol, in the Capitol building in Washington, D.C., and you go in, into, the, into the rotunda and you look up at, at the top on that dome, the, the dome of the Capitol rotunda has what? It's an artwork that is known as the Apotheosis of Washington. And if you first look up, you go, oh, I've seen this before. You've probably seen it maybe in a Catholic church or something like that, where you see Christ ascended and seated in the clouds of glory, surrounded by angels. Well, it's that scene. There are angels, there's clouds, there's he- you're looking at heaven, but in, where you think you would see Jesus, it's George Washington. Oh, and my. 
the the official name of the painting is the apotheosis of washington which apotheosis greek for to make a god of it's the deification of washington seated in the position of honor in heaven that's religious language that's religious uh vision and so america is a, a nation a culture it's a mixed bag but as an empire and a religion, it is a challenge to making true disciples of Jesus. Now, I know I just came barging out of the gate. <laughs> that may have been too much to do quickly, but, you know, we only got too much time. Yeah, no, I, I love it. I'm, I'm thankful. To follow up all of that, which is like, it's just mind blowing stuff. Like, uh, po- once you point all that out, it's now kind of hard not to see it, and you kind of kick yourself for not seeing it before. But I'm not a radical Anabaptist. I have a lot of Anabaptist <laughs> sympathies. But I'm technically I'm not an Anab. First of all, I'm not an Anabaptist. I don't belong to an Anabaptist denomination. And but I'm, I differ from the Anabaptist position at several points. I'm sympathetic to that. We share a lot of common ground. I speak in a lot of Anabaptist conferences, seminaries, churches, etc. Uh, but but I really do believe that Christians can engage in government. Hmm. I have a problem with Christians waging war. I think that's incompatible with following Jesus. I've written on that. That's where I would agree with the Anabaptist. But my father was a judge. And my brother is the prosecutor in Kansas City. And so I've grown up in a very politically and civically engaged family. I've grown up in a family committed to public service. And I, ultimately, I think that's a good thing. It can, it can be complicated. It can be tricky at times. It can present conundrums and ethical challenges, but still I think it's possible. And so I, I, don't, want hear, I don't want to hear people, I don't want people to hear me as if I'm a, a Christian anarchist, that is someone who just says there could be zero participation in civic life or government. That's that's not where I'm coming from. Yeah, no, it, thanks for clarifying that. And I think uh, we can kind of just keep jumping off of, of all that you've laid out there. The first question uh, that I have is in regard to the subtitle to your most recent book, Postcards, which is The Church in American Exile. And I wondered if you could expound on what you mean by that. Yeah, I can. <laughs> As a matter of fact, um, where to start? So the people of God, as found in the pages of Scripture, have a long history of exile. Of course, there was a time when, you know, as God first chooses the people, they're in they're in Egypt, but they're delivered out of Egypt and they're given a, a promised land. But then in 587 B.C., the great catastrophe befell them, where Jerusalem is destroyed, the temple's destroyed, and much of the populace was carried off as captives into forced exile to Babylon. And now there's a unique challenge. Typically, uh, in, in the ancient world, if your nation was conquered by another nation, well, what you did was just adopt the new nation's gods. Yeah, well, their gods beat our gods. We better worship their gods. And, you know, I don't think too many uh, Gentiles had much of a problem with that because they were they lived in a world that was awash with, you know, untold multitudes of gods. And so either to add some new ones or to, you know, tweak your allegiance wouldn't be seen as that big a deal. Jewish people, on the other hand, though, uh, they are the pioneers of monotheism. They worship one God. And uh, to worship other gods is a deal breaker. And so you cannot maintain your Jewish identity and all of a sudden start worshiping Bel and Nebo. So they are in the position where they, they're no longer a dominant culture. They are, uh, they are, not, they are they're a minority living in forced deportation, they're living as exiles who are going to seek to try to maintain their Jewish identity. It's a a narrow tightrope. It's a delicate balancing act. Uh, We see in the book of Daniel, for example, that the Hebrews can participate even in the government of of Babylon. That's where you get Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, all that. But there, there are lines they won't cross. And so 
there's this long history of the people of God having to live as exiles in a foreign culture. Then you get to the New Testament. And in the first epistle of Peter, the apostle is writing to uh, Christians living in the eastern provinces of the Roman Empire. And this is in the first you know, generation or two Christian faith. This is very, very, very early on. And so Peter is writing to the new Christians. They're all new Christians because Christianity itself is new. And he's writing to these Christians living in the eastern provinces of the Roman Empire, and he addresses them as exiles. He calls them exiles. Now, they're not exiles in the sense that they, they are not those that had once lived somewhere else, experienced a forced deportation, were now suddenly forced to live as foreigners in a foreign land. No, no. What Peter is saying is he's saying, now that you've been baptized, you no longer fully belong. And even though you have grown up here all of your life, even though you were born in Bithynia, let's say, that's one of the provinces he mentions. Even though you were born in Bithynia and you've lived there all of your life, now that you've been baptized into the Messiah, Jesus, now you have to somehow live as an exile. You're, there's a part of your life that now is not fully integrated with this wider society. You can't pledge your ultimate allegiance to the Roman Empire because in your baptism, you've pledged it to Jesus Christ. And so now you've got to learn how to live as exiles. And at the end of the letter, Peter's writing from Rome, but he writes cryptically, she who is in Babylon greets you. She is the church. Babylon isn't literally the city of Babylon. It's literally the city of Rome. But he's making the point that Rome is the new Babylon. So the church living as exile in Babylon is greeting, which is where I get the where I kind of imagine the title postcards from Babylon, that America is a modern day Babylon, not a modern day biblical Israel, but a modern day biblical Babylon. Mm -hmm. That is a huge distinction. Uh, most American Christians, especially evangelicals, have been scripted to think of America as a kind of modern biblical Israel. And so uh, this was our promised land, and we came over here, and, and God was leading us, and we, you know, we, the, the, the legends and myths about the pilgrims and all of that, and then it even plays out in the conquest of the land. That's why we can kind of salve our conscience, the ethnic cleansing that was done. From coast to coast, we we use the book of Joshua to come. Well, you know, it's kind of like that. God was given us. We had to drive out the Canaanites, that sort of thing. Uh, if you think of America as a kind of biblical Israel, you are going to eventually be engaging in some form of national idolatry. That's why Christians need to understand America not as a kind of biblical Israel, but as a kind of biblical Babylon. And this is the entire motive for the com for the composition of the final book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, which yep. most scholars believe was written in the 90s, the AD 90s, during the reign of Domitian. And what's interesting, this was not particularly a time of persecution. There had been a fierce persecution in the 60s, on uh, 50s and 60s under Nero, but things have kind of calmed down now. And the writer, John the Revelator, the writer of the apocalypse is concerned that Christians in the Roman Empire are getting too comfortable. And they are they are being they're in danger of being seduced into thinking that there's a nice, easy relationship between Jesus and the Caesar, Jesus and Rome, Jesus and the Empire, and with with massive creativity, John the Revelator emphasizes that no, Babylon at its heart remains a beast, and you cannot pledge your allegiance to Babylon and be faithful to the Lamb, to Jesus Christ. I think that, that there's no book of the Bible that's more, or more relevant for American Christians right now than the book of Revelation, but I've got this huge asterisk that's about this big by that, and that you have to learn how to read it right. Right. Not as a not as a futuristic foretelling of events of the 21st century written in the first century, but rather a prophetic critique of the Roman Empire and thus of all empires. The book of Revelation is not written about 
the geopolitical events of the 21st century. But it is for us if we can learn how to read it as this sustained prophetic critique of empire. Yep. I find that uh, really interesting because earlier you mentioned the placement of flags, and it seems that the first century Christians were very cognizant of the statements they were making when they said things like Jesus is Lord and the ramifications of that politically and socially. But it seems like today in modern Christianity, we aren't as cognizant of those sorts of statements or non-statements and the placements of the flags. And I would just like to know, why do you think that is? Because it seems like in the first century, Christians very much were self-aware of those sorts of actions. Well, there's a, a lot of water under the bridge, a lot of other stuff, too. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's, let's take the seminal Christian confession, Jesus is Lord. Today, to be honest, in a lot of years, that's very banal, very benign, very... You know, because basically how it's often heard is Jesus is the spiritual Lord of my spiritual life. Right. And that makes it very tame, very tepid, very safe, very non-threatening. It also makes it completely disconnected to what the early Christians were saying. Terms like Lord, Son of God, uh, Savior of the world, even Prince of Peace, all of these were imperial titles granted to the emperor by the Roman Senate. I mean, they would... They would have legislation and say, okay, we're going to confer now this title upon the emperor. He's going to be called Son of God, Savior of the world, Prince of Peace, King of Kings, uh, Lord. And so and, and this message would be sent throughout the realm upon the coins, which was the means of mass communication of the day. So you would have an, an image of the emperor with one of his, with one of his imperial titles. So when Christians began to say things like Jesus is Lord, they're, they're implying, and Caesar is not. You know, the first yep. gospel written is Mark. They're not arranged that way in our Bibles. We have Matthew first, but it's pretty clear. Mark is the first gospel. I'm just going to read the, here's Mark 1, 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I think we hear that. Yeah, okay. I, mean, I guess that's how you would start a gospel, wouldn't it? <laughs> but 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 the whole thing explodes with provocation in the first century. The beginning of the gospel, euangelion. Yes, yeah. I know it means good news, but what it really means, I mean I mean the literal the literal etymology means good news. Euangelion. But it was used as a royal decree, depending on whether it was good or not. It would be closer to a White House press release. It's an official statement from the emperor, okay? The beginning of the Eugelion of Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. King Jesus. He's the, I mean, it's a direct challenge to everything that would be presumed in the Roman Empire. And so, what I think most of our listeners, viewers, they'll understand that um, early Christianity, and by the way, early Christianity, probably AD 30, to 312, okay? So almost 300 years, three centuries. Most of us are aware that there were periodic persecutions of Christians. Um, why? The Roman Empire did not persecute Christians for what we would understand as religious reasons. The Roman Empire was remarkably tolerant of other religions. They had to be. That, that was, they, were, they were tolerant. Uh, what they were not tolerant at all about was a claim to a rival king or emperor or lord. That they saw as political. The early Christians were derided oftentimes as atheists, strangely enough, mm -hmm. because they didn't worship the gods of Rome, the gods of the empire, and they would just be conspicuously absent from the various national holidays that venerated their patron gods. So they called them atheists, and they persecuted them for political reasons. If the gospel is what it gets watered down to today, 
and basically here's the, here's the watered down, distorted, minimized, made safe, and palatable gospel. Jesus Christ died for you so that you could go to heaven and not hell when you die. So accept Jesus into your heart so you can go to heaven and not hell when you die. If that was the original apostolic gospel, there never would have been any persecution of Christians because mm-hmm. Rome would have rolled its eyes and said, we don't care. We don't care where you go when you die. <laughs> you can do whatever you want when you die. You can believe anything you want about the afterlife. We don't care about that. If you want to say that there's this God named Jesus who will take you to heaven when you die, more power to you. Um. But that's not what they said. Their gospel was essentially this. The world has a new emperor. And there is now a kingdom that has come from heaven. And it brings forgiveness. And it brings salvation. And it brings the purposes of God into the world. And it's all built around this new king, this new emperor, this new Lord. His name is Jesus. We know this because God raised him from the dead. That has deep political implications that would often lead Christians to have to suffer and sometimes die. I don't remember what we were talking about. We were, what we're talking about. <laughs> I don't remember. And, and okay. And, but, and then why did that change? Why right. did that change? Yep. Okay. So the church is growing at a rate of 40% per decade from Pentecost to the beginning of the fourth century. So that somewhere between 8 and 12 uh, percent, demographic historians estimate, of the Roman Empire was Christian. And this is a time when to be Christian was costly. I mean, it was, it was dangerous to be a Christian. It, it, it carried no social advantage. And yet they had managed to convert somewhere in the vicinity of 10 percent of the, of the Roman Empire at the beginning of the fourth century. And then this event happened, this thing. Rome was having another one of its civil wars, as they often did, because the line of succession for emperors wasn't very clear at all. And there were two rival would-be, well, two rival generals, both would-be emperors. Uh, Constantine and, is it Maximilian or Maximanus or Max? We'll call it Max. I <laughs> forgot. <laughs> Sounds good. Constantine and General Max uh, were both vying to become the next emperor, and there was a decisive battle known as the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. On the evening before the battle, Constantine would claim that he had a vision. He saw a Christian symbol, probably a cross, in the heavens with these words, In this sign you shall conquer. Of course, conquer is a euphemism for kill. So in this sign, go kill your enemies. And so he applied the Christian symbol, probably the cross, although we're not exactly told, could be the Cairo, Mm -hmm. and applied it to the weapons and armory of his soldiers. They were victorious, and he becomes emperor. He then gives Christianity favored status, issues the Edict of Milan, and, and suddenly... For all intents and purposes, Christianity becomes the state religion of the Roman Empire. And the church went along with this, and I don't fault them. They made a mistake. It was wrong. Uh, history proves that. I mean, it's it, the creation of Christendom, Christendom was ultimately the disaster, and we know it's a disaster because by the time you get to the 20th century, you have millions and millions of Christians killing one another in the name of national allegiance in the two great wars in Europe. But they couldn't foresee that. So I, in one sense, I don't blame them. I said, yes, they made a mistake. I think it was probably almost an inevitable mistake. But let's not continue to make it. <laughs> For God's right. sake, let's not continue to make it. But, but that created a problem. So if you're going to say, okay, we've got, we've got a Christian empire now with a Christian emperor, although Constantine himself uh, seems to be giving silent testimony to the impossibility of that task in that he delayed his baptism until his deathbed, which was not Christian practice, which is him witnessing to the fact that I don't think you really can be a Christian and an emperor simultaneously, which is, which is Constantine essentially saying, essentially saying, I don't think I can be a Christian until I'm dead. <laughs> So, so here's the problem. Um, if, if, if we're going to say, okay, now we've got a Christian emperor. Well, Christians for three centuries have been saying Jesus is Lord and, and laying down their lives for this. Jesus is Lord. Jesus. But now we've got a Christian emperor. And so we have to kind of say Constantine is Lord. So 
what do you do with Jesus? You can't just be a Christian and get rid of Jesus. Well, Jesus gets demoted to secretary of afterlife affairs. And the task of Jesus now is to get disembodied parts of people into heaven when they die, but we will continue to run the world according to the ways of Caesar, and thus the way of the sword displaces the way of the cross. And then you have the long bloody legacy of Christendom. So he's like the secretary of the afterlife? Affairs. (laughs) Yeah. 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 So I, I would be curious to ask you then, what, one of the things I see when it comes to Christians and patriotism is it's like if anyone comes up, especially in our American context, and says something against the way that America does something, I usually see Christians leading the charge and saying things like, well, if you don't like that, then you should leave, or you're not being patriotic or it like are actually coming out against people who speak out against America, usually from their own Christian convictions. And what, why do you think that is the case? Because the two have been conflated. They have been formed by a myth that God has raised up America and that God is accomplishing his purposes in the earth through America. I think that's nonsense. For example, if somebody said, well, is America a Christian nation? I said, well, no, that was England. England was a Christian nation. I mean, they said, I mean, I mean, they had a state church. I mean, it's in their constitution. They are a Christian nation. Jefferson and the other founding fathers were radical. By the way, let me just throw in this caveat. I, I think the outstanding thing about America, if we could imagine the history of America written 300 years from now, I think the thing that will stand out the most is that America pioneered the idea of secular governance. Now, after America pioneered it, France took it up and took it further faster. But it begins with Jefferson and Franklin and those cats. And it was truly a new thing. Okay, what, what if we didn't have any particular religion? There's no religion that governs the state or that the state is, is, is committed to. We just have a nation that's a nation that's a nation and we don't involve God in this. So America was certainly not founded as a Christian nation. I'm sure that Jefferson and Franklin would be appalled at this. No, we were intentionally not doing that. Uh, England was the Christian nation. America says we're going to do something different. Um, But beyond that, of course, no nation can be a Christian nation. The only thing that can be a Christian is a person that's baptized. You can't baptize a nation. I mean, you can go through the motions of it, but it doesn't work that way. Uh, What God has raised up is not a nation. What God has raised up is Jesus Christ from the dead. Yep. And God is accomplishing his purposes through those that surround him because covenant identity of the as the people of God goes through a transition with the incarnation, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, so that, according to Christian theology, membership in the covenant community of God's people is no longer defined by ethnicity, circumcision, and Torah observance, but by faith, baptism, and obedience to Jesus. Let's say loyalty, loyalty to Jesus as Messiah. And so that's that's the nation. Um, remember Jesus very provocatively. In his final week, he says, he says, you know, the kingdom is about to be taken away from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. Well, what is that nation? Well, it doesn't, it, it doesn't, it isn't fulfilled by Byzantium or Rome or Russia or Germany or England or Spain or the United States, all of which have had experience in trying to be some form of Christian empire. No, it's the people, it's it's the baptized community of people that gain their identity through faith, baptism, and allegiance to Jesus. But when a church is hosted by a superpower, that church always faces unique challenges of maintaining fidelity of faith to Christ. Uh, we want to we want to go along, to get along, we want to we want to believe that when we say uh, America's number one, that God's like, yeah, right on. We're, I'm there with you. Uh, 
no, God, that's, that's not how God thinks at all. Uh, God has no more commitment to the economic flourishing of the United States than he does to Zimbabwe or whatever nation you want to name. Yeah. If I could just ask a quick follow-up to that. So I guess then I would ask too how you would respond because when I see Christians making accusations, especially against other Christians, of anti-patriotism, usually the first thing they point to is, well, Paul says in Romans 13, yep. like we need to submit to the governing authorities. So how do we how do we reconcile that with all the things we're talking about right now? Here's what Paul says. First of all, Romans 13 doesn't start with Romans 13. It starts with Romans 12. <laughs> yep. You know, the, the chapter divisions are a later device to help us you know, find our way around. But Paul is obviously borrowing from his knowledge of the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, you know, if your enemy's hungry, feed him, thirsty, give him drink. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And then he changes the pronoun. He's been talking about you, you Christians, you, you, you. And then when he begins to talk about Caesar, he changes the pronoun to he. And he says, look, Caesar can serve the purposes of a civil society. Caesar helps maintain order. Uh, Caesar will arrest, you know, bandits and those sorts of things. And so Paul can speak favorably of the function of civil government, even though it's pagan. He says, you know, whether, whether you're a Christian or a pagan, it's good that you arrest murderers or that you arrest robbers or that you try to keep the roads safe and those sorts of things. But Paul's real concern is revolution. Paul is a Jew. Paul is, has been in Jerusalem. He knows that the, the revolutionary fervor is fomenting throughout the empire, especially among Jewish people. This is the very thing that Jesus warned Jerusalem about. He says, you guys won't listen to me. You won't embrace the way of peace. And so within a generation, the whole thing's going to be destroyed. And Paul knows that there is a tendency for people to want to engage in revolution against Rome, especially among Jews. Many of, many of the early Christians are also Jewish. And he's saying, don't do that. And remember, Caesar doesn't carry that sword around for decoration. You decide, you decide to launch a violent revolution against Rome, don't be surprised when the Roman legions come and grind you to dust. That's basically the warning he's given, which is interesting. I don't hear these American Christians citing that in reference to the Revolutionary War in 1776. Right. Uh, weren't they supposed to submit to the king and not be involved in a violent revolution? Um. So, and again, and, and th this is historical fact, this was a favorite text of Nazi-supporting Christians in the 1930s in Germany. So when Romans 13 is used to support uh, Christian support for Nazi agenda, well then, you know, okay. So we, we already know that Romans 13 can be misused. Let's not do that. Yeah, absolutely. The guy who says be subject to the governing authorities, the guy that wrote that was executed by the governing authorities for not being subject to them. Man, that is a great point. And uh, man, I am so pleased um, that we're unpacking all of this in this podcast. I think it's such an important message, and I'm happy that we're um, able to help get that message out. Um, but I would love to kind of shift gears a little bit. Um, and what we like to do on our show towards the end is try to think about what better questions could be that we could be asking that will bring do two things. Help bring unity to all perspectives and help call us into action. And if we could first focus on that first one, which is unity. You know, I won't say that we live in the most polarizing time in our nation because we obviously, you know, fought a civil war. But it's a pretty polarizing time right, right. now with the religious right uh, conservatives and Democrats, the left, and what are called progressives. And then there's people that fall everywhere in between or don't even really care uh, or think they don't care. And I'm wondering, what are some questions we can all be asking each other or asking ourselves that can help unify these camps? I think we need to ask the question, are we willing to listen to those that share a different, share a common faith, but a different political opinion in good faith. 
we're, we're so quick. I just saw, I can't remember the exact dates, but I think it was something like 40 years ago. I could be wrong on that, but it's something in that neighborhood. 10% of Republicans, Democrats hated, you know, the other, the other side. It was, it was the same. It was pretty much the same. I mean, 10% of Republicans will say, I hate Democrats. And then 10% of uh, Democrats will say, I hate Republicans. That was 40 years ago. Today, both of them, it's about 50-50. That should be alarming to us. That's dangerous. Um, so I think we should ask ourselves, is there a way I can listen to those that share a different political opinion and not dismiss them as mm -hmm. evil or idiotic? Can I understand why they might hold to the political position they hold to? Of course, I, I urge Christians to hold their political positions lightly. You, you can, you're free to have a political position. Christians are free to be Republicans or Democrats or Libertarians or Socialists or Tories or whatever. Uh, one of the things I, I am proud about in our church is that we are not a, a political monolith. We have pretty wild, far out, you know, Bernie supporters, and we have Trump supporters sharing pews together. It creates tension from time to time, no doubt. But what we've been able to do at Word of Life is, and I'm quite sincere about this, is we've been able to create a, con a, a culture of kindness. So it's okay at Word of Life. You can be a Trump supporter, which you cannot be as unkind. Mm. Uh, you can be a Bernie supporter, whoever you know you want to have, um, but you cannot be cruel or unkind about it. You kind of have to hold that thing loosely. You can have that, but but what we really are is not followers of an elephant or a donkey, but a lamb, and we have to be lamb-like in our treatment of the other. I think, though, if we're talking about what questions can we ask, um, ask questions like this. Can I see the humanity in my political opponent? Can I see, can I hear them in good faith? Can I listen to them and not simply, before they even finish the sentence, be forming how I'm going to call them an idiot or evil? Can I, can I hear them? It's, it's, the Saint, it's the prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there's hatred, let me sow love. Where there's injury, pardon. Where there's doubt, faith. Where there's despair, hope. Where there's darkness, light. Where there's sadness, joy. O oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be understood as to understand. Mm -hmm. And it goes on. But uh, we, we, we want to be understood. Well, maybe the question we should ask is, uh, am I willing to understand before being understood? Am I willing to understand honestly? what is motivating my political opponent. You still may disagree with it, but can you, can you treat them as human? And, in, right. and, and in, in a Christian church context, embrace them as your brother or sister in Christ. Yep. Uh, one, of the most, one of the most alarming things I saw during the Obama administration was an unwillingness on the part of many Christians to call Barack Obama their brother in Christ. You know, it, it's one thing to say, okay, this man is my brother in Christ and I, you know, deeply disagree with his politics. That's fine. That's, that's accessible. Uh, that's acceptable provided you can still maintain kindness. Uh, but to say, because I don't like the politics of this man, I will not accept his testimony that he had an adult conversion, was baptized, confesses Jesus is Lord, and worships regularly in church. No, he's not a Christian. Uh, that, that, that to me, that gets dangerously close to what Paul seems to be condemning in the practice of the Corinthians church and the way they observed communion. They brought their social divisions, their class divisions, into the church. So you had at this time, the, the communal meal of the Eucharist was an actual meal. And instead of sharing it, they were all bringing their own meal. So the rich would have sumptuous feasts and, they're, and fine wine, and they're even getting drunk. And it's interesting, Paul isn't so much upset about them getting drunk in church, although I don't think he liked that. Uh, but what he, what he was really upset was the fact that, okay, you've got the rich here with their sumptuous feasts, and the poor here don't have anything, and they're going hungry. And you've brought your 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 
class divisions to the Lord's table. And he says, this is, this is so bad for whatever he means by this. It's a mysterious statement. But he says, for this reason, many are sick and some have died. So I think this is a serious sin. Um, we can have political opinions. Most people have some. Um, but we cannot make it a means of division for uh, our Christian faith. In other words, I'm just not allowed to say, if you voted for Trump, you're not a Christian. And I can't say, if you voted for Bernie, you're not a We are not allowed to do that. In fact, that's a very dangerous thing. Again, I stopped asking questions and just went into my... <laughs> no, no, no. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, this has been really helpful. And uh, I was really pleased um, when I started reading Postcards in Babylon that uh, Walter Brueggemann wrote the foreword yeah, I was and, too. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. I was and, more pleased than you were. <laughs> and uh, as we get towards the end of our <laughs> discussion today, um, I read the prophetic imagination a couple years ago, and it it really like changed the way I view a lot of this. And I just wanted to ask you, as we uh, start to wrap things up, he mentions in the prophetic imagination about how, and I'm not going to, do justice to Brueggemann's words here, but he talks about how a prophet does two things mainly in that he hears the cry of the people and he sympathizes and he sheds a tear along with his people and critiques the the problems with empire, but then a prophet also paints a vision for the future, one that we can follow. And I would just like to know, uh, as we start to kind of wrap things up, what sort of future do you see that Christians could aspire to when it comes to our role as both Christ followers and Americans and how we live together, reconciling those two. I long to see a post-Christendom Christianity. But again, we have to begin to think differently. Uh, what will Christianity look like in America 50 years from now? I think it'll be chastened. I think it'll be, in general, smaller. Uh, I think we cannot presume to be the dominant culture much longer. In fact, I think Christendom has already... I think the great collapse that we see in Western Europe is really present within America, too, except it's not quite as prevalent because currently uh, Christian faith is so tangled up in civil religion that it looks like it's more vibrant and flourishing than it is. So, I mean, it sounds like I'm speaking negatively, but actually I find hope here that I, I think Christians are going to be willing to be a subculture, to be a little bit odd, to be a little bit freakish. And then, and once we recognize, okay, well, we're not the dominant culture and we're not going to be, we're not even going to aspire to that, then we can let go of the culture war agendas and just get about the business of being the church. Mm. You know, change the world rhetoric can be dangerous. Uh, because when we talk about if our, if our ambition, our goal is to change the world, then we find ourselves reaching for the most pragmatic way to affect change, and that is Caesar's sword. And I think this is essentially the third wilderness temptation of Christ, that Jesus discerns as bowing down and worshiping the devil. That for Jesus to make take the most expedient, pragmatic, quickest route to changing the world, which would be just to act like all the pharaohs and Caesars and all of that, um, he, he would have done it for a good end, but he saw that as a compromise that was equivalent to bowing down to the devil. And so he said, no, it's going to have to come another way. So instead of trying to change the world, uh, which puts a lot of pressure on us, and then we're, we're seduced to the means of coercive power. Why don't we just be the, the world already changed by Christ? Yeah. And may our lives and our communities be so distinctive, so different, that people aspire to belong to it. Yeah. That's the hope that I have. We got to wait. That. I, yeah, that's I, really I, helpful. Um, I, I'd love to just kind of end then with asking this follow-up question to you. I think when you talked about the different types of patriotism, kind of what a, a healthy view of patriotism versus unhealthy, that, that really helped me. And when I'm trying to consider what does it look like for Christians to interact within 
America that maybe there's a difference between loving America versus worshiping America. Um, and I'm curious, just what, what would you say maybe are even some practical ways of what it looks like for Christians to love America? Cause that, that's, that's what we're called to be, but without worshiping America. If, if, you, if you say, I love America, it's very impressive, but, but that's so nebulous. That's so vague. Right. If you say, I love America, I'd rather, I'd rather you say, and I'm involved in the PTA. And I'm um, doing practical things in my town, in my city, that to help make this city, this town, this place a better place to live. I'm actually engaged in helpful. It doesn't have to be political ways. It could be in community service, volunteering. Uh, you know, we had a bunch of people from our church. We're right on the Missouri River, and with all the snows we've had and the floods, it's starting to flood. And so, a whole bunch of people from our church. Uh, after church Sunday, went downtown and just worked all day long filling sandbags and stacking sandbags. Uh, that's the kind of love for America, where it's that I think is to be commended. It's not, you know, I can I can have just a fancy. I love America, and we always win our wars, and and you know, I see a big, you know, fighter jet fly over, and I feel patriotic. Well, what is that? You know, how does that contribute to human flourishing? But go work in a food kitchen, go fill sandbags, uh, become interested in helping your schools. You know, one of the things, Another, I'm kind of bragging about our church, but dang, we got to go to church. I should brag about it. Uh, we have several elementary schools. I've forgotten the number now. That every year, uh, we, we, pick, we work with, with, with the public schools, elementary schools, in poor areas where it could be that the children will show up on the first day of school and not have all their school supplies. And so what we do is we go out and we buy different kinds so they don't look the same, all these different kinds of backpacks, fill them with all of the prescribed uh, uh, you know, school supplies, and then give them to the children so they show up. That would be loving America. That would be doing yep. something to actually make the place better. Like, you know, I love my city. I love living here. I want it to be good. Let's work to make it good. Absolutely. Yeah, I really like that. Yeah. Um, I hope our listeners have found this conversation as valuable as I have, and I'm pretty sure you guys have too. And uh, before we uh, wrap up, if our listeners wanted to learn more about you or in your work, uh, where could they go? You could go to brianzond.com. Just spell my name right. You'll find it. Z A H N D. You just Google me. There aren't any other Brian Zons. You Google Brian Zon. You go. You Google Zon, and you're probably going to get me. And because uh, there just aren't many of us, unless you go to Switzerland. And uh, so you know, I'm active on Twitter, where I'm a bit of a provocateur, try to be nice, but a little bit provocative there. Instagram, I'm nicer, and Facebook, I just post some stuff now and then. Yeah, everyone runs into tension on Twitter. Active in all of those sorts of things, and yeah. yeah. Awesome. Word of Life Church. Our website is W O L C, like like WordOfLifeChurch.com, and there all my sermons and stuff are there. This has been a really great conversation, and we'd love to have you back someday in the future because I know you've written more than just about nationalism and exile. And you have a lot to say about other stuff, <laughs> but this has been a really great conversation. Invite me, and I'd love to come back. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That sounds good. Thank, Thank you. you very much. So that was our interview with Pastor Brian Zond, and uh, my mind is officially blown. I pledge allegiance <laughs> to the Better Questions podcast, in which this podcast is named uh, Under America, Invisible. This is a podcast, though we're on video. With unity and action for all. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like we kind of crushed it a little bit. Chris was giving me some nice, gentle toe nudges to tell me when to speak and when not to. So, you know, that was helpful. I never did one for when not to. I just, I could tell you wanted to ask something. So I was like, ask it. And for those of you who've been enjoying our podcast, just a little word of encouragement. Don't be shy when it comes to sharing any posts or videos or links because that really helps us get new listeners and new viewers. So if you really did enjoy the episode, just... You know, drop a little thumbs up on Facebook, press that share button. 
I don't know, talk to some random person on the street and harass them nicely. You know, whatever it is. You could also uh, rate and review the podcast on iTunes, which would go a long way towards uh, helping us uh, just generate more of an audience. And also, even though this was the last episode of the season, if you haven't watched all of our other episodes, go back and get all caught up before season three drops in not too much longer. And hopefully next season, I will be in a much more comfortable chair. But, you know, a guy can wish.